fishers. And this tells the story of three fishermen who go out on a fishing trip and get caught in a storm, and unfortunately, they lose their lives. But the overall theme of the song is more along the lines of, they took this risk because they had to go out and work for their loved ones and for their family. And even though there was a chance they could not come back, they did it anyways. And so this is Three Fishers. Three fishers went sailing out into the west, out into the west as the sun went down. He thought of the woman who loved him the best, and the children stood watching them out of the town. For men must work, and women must weep, for there's little to earn, and there's many to keep. And the harbor Bobby moaning, and the harbor Bobby moaning. Three wives sat up in the lighthouse tower, and they trimmed the lamps as the sun went down. And they looked at the squall, and they looked at the showers, and the night wind came rolling in. Ragged and brown, for men must work and women must weep. Those storms be sudden and the waters run deep, and the harbor bar be moaning, and the harbor bar be moaning. Three corpses lie up on the shining sands in the morning gleam as the tides went down, and the women were weeping and wringing their hands for those who would never come back to the town. For men must work, and women must weep, and the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep. So goodbye to the bar and its moaning, oh goodbye to the bar and its moaning, for men must work, and women must weep, and the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep. So goodbye to the bar and its moaning, oh goodbye to the bar and its moaning. My friends, it is I, Rorick Rainerson, once again, and to continue with this theme of performing in three different styles that fit a theme of three, I'm going to tell you the story of how Odin stole the mead of poetry. Now, this story comes to us from a man named Snorri Sturluson, who was a 13th century Icelandic author, poet, and historian. However, it's very likely that this story is actually many, many hundreds of years older, for Snorri wrote this story down to preserve the Old Norse myths and legends and sagas when they were still pagans and before they converted to Christianity. So according to this Norse myth, there is a magic mead of poetry that will grant whoever drinks it knowledge in poetry, scholarly knowledge, or it'll just increase their general wisdom slash intelligence. And eventually this mead found its way to a giant named Sutinger wanted to keep it all for himself, and so he locked it away inside of a mountain. Now when Odin heard about this, he too desired to have the mead, and so he came up with a plan to steal this mead from Sutinger. And so he goes to Sutinger's brother Baugi, and he goes to Baugi's farm, where he finds Baugi in a rather upset state, for Baugi had just learned that nine of his field hands had been found dead. And now, he was worried about whether he would have enough help to finish the summer's harvest. And so Odin proposed a deal with him. He said, hey, my friend, I will do all of the work of these nine men by myself, if, in exchange, you get me some of the mead that your brother has. Now, Baugi believed this to be a good deal, and so he accepted it. But this was the first trick that Odin would play to steal the mead. For unbeknownst to Baugi, it was actually Odin who was responsible for the death of his nine men. And so, true to his word, 
Odin worked the entire summer and did the work of all of those nine men by himself. So Baugi went to Sutinger to ask for some of the meat to complete his end of the bargain. But Sutinger told him no and sent him away. So Baugi returned to Odin, and together they came up with a plan to steal the mead by tunneling underneath the mountain where it was kept. And so the two of them drilled a tunnel underneath this mountain, and eventually they found the storage room in which this mead was kept. And they drilled a small enough hole for Odin to squeeze himself into to steal the mead. But when Odin entered the storage room, he realized that Sudnigur did not leave this mead unguarded for he had placed his daughter Gunnl out there to guard the meat. And so Odin transformed himself into the appearance of an extremely beautiful man, probably still looking to his majesty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he proposed a deal with Gunnl. He said, my friend, if you give me just three sips of that meat that you guard, in exchange, I being the handsome young man that I am, will sleep with you for three nights. Now Gunlaug really liked this deal, so she accepted it, but this was the second trick that Odin would play to steal the mead. For he did not intend to just sip the mead, he intended to steal it. And so after three nights, he goes to claim his three sips of mead. Now the mead was kept in three cauldrons, and so Odin went to the first cauldron, and with one giant sip, he drained the cauldron dry. And he went to the second cauldron, and once again he took one giant sip and drained the cauldron dry again. And then he went to the third cauldron, and once more he drained the cauldron dry. So now Odin contained all of the mead of poetry inside him. At this point, he transformed himself again, this time into the shape of an eagle. And he flew out of the mountain and raced back to his home in Asgard with the mead of poetry still inside him. Now when Gunlaf realized what had happened and how this man had tricked her and stolen all of the mead that she was supposed to guard, she went running to her father to tell him what has happened. And when he learned of this, he became outraged, and he too transformed himself into the shape of an eagle, and he gave chase to Odin. But Odin was able to make it back to his home before Sutnigar caught up with him, and he regurgitated the mead into some cauldrons of his own. But not long after he did this, Susinger arrived at his home asking for the man that stole all of his mead. But this is where Odin played his third and final trick. For you see, when he first appeared before Gunlaf, he appeared in disguise. And not only did he look different than he did now, but he gave her a false name as well. And so when Susinger describes the man who stole his mead, not only did he give the wrong description, but he also gave the wrong name as well. And so Odin was like, well, I am old man Odin. Clearly I don't look like this person that you have just described. I do not know this person, for this is my home and I live here. This man does not live here, so you must go somewhere else to find your me. Now Sutinger believed the lie and deception that Odin gave him, and so he left empty-handed, thus allowing Odin to keep the mead which he shared with the other Aesir gods, with any mortals that he deemed worthy. And so that is how Odin played three tricks to steal three sips and steal the mead of poetry. Your Majesties, for this final piece, I propose to put my documentation a little bit separately here, so I'll hand you a copy of this. My friends! I'm here once again. I am Rorik Rainerson, and to complete this trilogy of a different style of piece, now I complete this poem. Now, your majesties obviously were impressed with my previous pieces, but there was one other person who was a little bit impressed as well. For you see, in between rounds, Odin himself came to me and gave me some of his mead to help me perform this poem. So thank you, all, Father. So my friends, for my final piece, I'd like to perform an original poem I wrote in an Old Norse style called Drakkvet, which translates to courtly meter. Now, like the story I told in the last round, we get most of our information about this style from Snorri Sturluson. 
And like the story, it's probably much older than the 13th century when he wrote this book. Now the rules to Dracovet are really complex and really like intricate, but there are some main rules that I believe fit this competition. For you see, every line of this poem can only have six syllables per line. And six, as we were demonstrated in the last round, <laughs> is a magic number divisible by three. <laughs> Additionally, the core element to Dracovet poems are three matching forms of alliteration. Two of them are found in odd lines, and the third matching form is found in the beginning of the next even line. So now that I've told you a little bit about the style that I write in, let me tell you about the poem itself. For this is a praise poem that I wrote for my good friend, Centurion Magnus Crepenson. Now I've known Magnus pretty much since he started playing in the SCA, and I have watched him grow into a powerful fighter and a wise leader, and I am honored to call him my friend, for he inspires me in so many ways. And so I wrote this poem to praise his deeds and accomplishments. So here now, the deeds of Magnus Crepenson. Hold tongues bare, for heroes held to fill the silver tongue's mind's eyes, for meadkin most worthy of boasting. Whale road's breath sent raiding rider, a sea glider, to meet with his mighty master to learn faster. Blood-soaked bird, the blinding battle crane. Your training's fame has brought the fighting feather cloak as token. Warbard's love spoke weaving words to raise his praising. Warbard sings the swordsman's song to brag for Magnus. Woohoo!